Hello everyone and welcome to Designing Characters, where I explain turning characters from my mind and other media into characters for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Here we focus on builds and personality traits, utilizing standard array or point by with D&D Beyond's layout. Today we're working on Byakuya Kuchiki from Bleach, head of the Noble Kuchiki family and captain of the 6th Division. Yakia is one of the strongest characters in the series, and best example of lawful I've seen in a series period. Considering he's just watching as his effective little sister slash daughter figure is about to be killed, but the moment she's saved... <laughs> so, what do we need for our overtly serious, noble, pretty boy with a killer personality? Also, probably some of the best actual character development in Bleach. First, after images. Byakuya is one of the fastest characters in the series and has better mastery over flash depth than even other masters. So we need after images so believable they could be considered flash clones. Next, we need a sapient sword bound to Byakuya's soul that grants him a variety of powers, including a tornado of blades and dozens of floating swords. Finally, though you only use a handful of spells, all of them are tremendously powerful and have a decent variety of elemental effects and abilities. For ability scores, we're going with point by. If your DM allows rolls or requires standard array, that's fine. Just try to match these as much as possible and keep multiclassing minimums in mind. Raise your charisma to 14. You're handsome, charming, and a natural leader. This also represents your immense spiritual power later. Raise both dexterity and constitution to 14. You're in great condition and health with significant grace, stamina, and durability. Next, put your wisdom to 12 and intelligence to 10. You're perceptive with the decent force of will and have the education of a noble. Finally, your strength is 8. Most of your feats that are physical are done by infusing your sword with magic, and we kind of have to cut something. For race, you are effectively a purely lawful celestial. But you can't really be that in D&D, so instead we're going to make a variant Asimar. A Celestial-Blooded Guardian of the Dead. This will increase your Charisma by 2 and Wisdom by 1, for new totals of 16 Charisma and 13 Wisdom. Infuriatingly, because odd numbers really bother me. With this choice, you gain Celestial as a bonus language, 60 feet of Dark Vision, Celestial Resistance granting you resistance to Necrotic and Radiant Damage, and the feature of Celestial Legacy. This allows you to cast several bonus spells based on your level each one per long rest, using your Charisma as your casting ability. On creation, you gain the Cantrip Light. At third level, the spell Lesser Restoration. And finally, at fifth level, the spell Daylight. Each of these are cast at their base level. Byakuya doesn't have any straight-up healing keto, technically, but remember that hit points aren't directly related to your body. They can correlate to his raw will power and the ability to push through debilitating effects instead. We do get a decent amount of Byakuya's past, and translating it into Faerunian lore isn't too difficult, thankfully. Though there's definitely going to be some changes, as always. Raised in a household of a powerful noble family with celestial ancestry, you are raised into the family business. All members of a large cult that works with your local militia to become their effective special forces. Worshipping a power and unknown not-god named the Soul King, a being that seems to directly serve Kelimvor. This being imbues its power into various weapons that are distributed to full-fledged members of the cult. These cultists are granted rank, special privileges, and an unnatural power connecting them to their patron using the weapons as focal points. As a member of this organization, you begin delving into various missions with the simple goal in mind to maintain the balance of life and death, to hunt the undead and monsters of the world, to help the souls of the dead move on to their next stage of existence. This is where we'll begin this story. Work with your DM on exactly how you can tie in to the current plot that they want to run. Maybe everyone is a member of this organization. Maybe the character has been given a mission and needs to travel the world and simply do their duties as they fight and destroy the undead. Perhaps they are the recipient of visions from Kelimvor or their patron. With these details settled, we'll be taking the Variant Noble background. This will grant you proficiency in acrobatics and athletics to show off the militaristic training you endured as a child. As well, take proficiency in calligraphers' tools for your fancy paperwork and cooking utensils for that expertly brewed tea that you can make. 
you also gain the background feature of Position of Privilege, which allows you to use your noble birth to affect a populace or individual in a number of ways depending on how you've set up your bloodline with the DM beforehand. Now, moving on to class, we're going with Sorcerer. This is to represent your natural powers granted to you through your celestial blood, and though you train to hone and understand them, your power is still granted to you through your spiritual power, not learned from a book. Sorcerers have a d6 hit die and gain proficiency in daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaves, and light crossbows. Call the dagger a wakazashi for now, and you have your weapon granted to you during your initial training, alongside perhaps a quarterstaff. You also gain proficiency in arcana and intimidation due to your overwhelming presence and dedicated studies to understanding your own powers. Finally, granting proficiency in constitution and charisma saving throws. Choose your sorceress origin and take Divine Soul, representing your celestial blood. Specifically, granting you the Divine Magic feature. Choose Law, allowing you to learn the Bless spell for when you need to prove that you're just a bit better than everyone else. Or, if you're feeling generous, when you need to prove Rukia and Renji are just a bit better than everyone else as well. But for the moments when you really need to prove you're better, you have the feature Favored by the Gods, allowing you to add 2d4 to any failed attack roll or saving throw once per long rest. Finally, you get access to spellcasting, granting you 4 cantrips and 2 first level spells. Take Green Flame Blade for when you need to infuse some extra power into your sword swing, causing the target to be sheathed in fiery, glowing cherry blossoms, or just pure spiritual energy in the form of fire. Along with this, take Firebolt, representing your Shakaho. Next, take Guidance, adding 1d4 to an ability check, proving once more that you're a bit better than everyone else with the flick of a wrist. And Thaumaturgy, for a variety of effects representing your resounding spiritual pressure. Cause your eyes to glow, voice to boom, and the ground to shake. For your spells, take Shield to add 5 to your AC as a reaction until the start of your next turn, with a burst of spiritual pressure to slow down an attack. Next, take Protection from Evil and Good for a variety of effects that make fighting aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead far easier than it normally should be. Thus rendering you immune to conditions like Charmed, Frightened, or Possession, and forcibly causing disadvantage on any attack rolls they make against those protected by this spell. Hollow are practically crushed under your spiritual pressure. It makes sense their underhanded tactics don't work very well on you or your soldiers. Now for level 2, we're immediately switching over to Warlock. You're finally given your official blade that connects you to your family's patron, infusing you with greater magical prowess and beginning your training in true martial combat. Warlocks have a d8 hit die and grant you additional proficiency in simple weapons and light armor at base, though this will be increased further in a moment. Choose your otherworldly patron and take Hexblade, your sapient blade that's chosen you and funnels your patron's power through it into you. This grants you an extended spell list to choose from using your Pact Magic, which allows you two cantrips and two first level spells. Take Eldritch Blast as your overpowered show spell, and Thunderclap when you need to unleash your spiritual pressure in an explosion to send your opponents flying back. For your two first level spells, take Armor of Agathus and reflavor it into an Armor of Condensed Spiritual Pressure, or Cherry Blossom Blades that strike back and bite into the flesh of your attacker. Maybe even talk with your DM about reflavoring this and changing its damage type too. Along with this, take Hellish Rebuke, and when someone attacks you, send your reaction to release an explosion of cherry blossoms to sear across your opponent's flesh. With these spells, you also acquire Hexblade's Curse. This is a powerful mark you can pressure into your target within 30 feet of you by focusing your spiritual pressure on them for up to a minute as a bonus action, once per long or short rest. This mark grants a plethora of effects. Your attacks against the target have a critical range of 19 to 20, all damage rolls now add your proficiency bonus to them. Finally, if the mark target dies, you're healed an amount of hit points equal to your warlock level plus your charisma modifier. And as the final benefit, you have the Hex Warrior feature, allowing you to use medium armor, shields, and martial weaponry. Similarly, you gain the ability to bond with a single weapon, turning it into your Hex weapon and allowing you to use your charisma modifier instead of strength or dexterity for your attack and damage rolls with that weapon. This weapon is a part of your very magic and spirit. You don't wield it through physical ability, but spiritual. 
Level 2 Warlocks gain their Eldritch Invocations. This grants them little mini-feats. Take Agonizing Blast to add your Charisma modifier to the damage roll of each Eldritch Blast you fire, making those show now much deadlier. Along with this, take Armor of Shadows to cast Mage Armor on yourself at will without expending any spell slots or materials. The robes you wear most assuredly are not armor. Now, if you're alright with wearing armor and breaking character, quote unquote, a bit, take Eldritch Mind instead to grant you advantage on constitution saving throws made to maintain concentration on spells. Keep in mind that these builds are not meant to be followed to the T. Take them and use them as a basis and play with them to make your own character using Biakia as an example. In the D&D world, he would probably be wearing armor, just like anyone else that isn't specifically trained to fight without it. You also gain an additional first level spell. Take Expedious Retreat, and you now have your first basic form of flash step. Third level warlocks choose a Pact Boon. Take Pact of the Blade. Forming your Asashi? Asachi? I don't know Japanese. Into your packed weapon and fully manifesting it into a proper Zanpakuto. The weapon is now truly bound to you, causing it to become magical for the sake of ignoring resistances and immunities. It also allows you to shunt it into a pocket dimension and summon it at will. You also gain your first second level spell. Take the Cloud of Daggers spell and reflavor it as a cloud of swirling pink petals akin to blades. Unfortunately, you can't move this spell after you form it, but now you have a basic Shikai Blast. Now we bounce back to Sorcerer. Second level Sorcerers gain Fonts of Magic, allowing you to turn your Sorcery Points into extra spell slots for now. This also grants you an additional first level spell. Take Cure Wounds and roleplay it as you getting back up after sustaining damage that should have been critical through raw willpower. Or roleplay it as healing because you aren't literally Biakia and these guides are not law. Level 3 Sorcerers gain Meta Magic, allowing you to pump your spells full of anime juice and make them better than any other caster through the use of using incantations even when you don't need them. Take Quicken Spell, allowing you to spend 2 sorcery points to change a spell's casting time from one action to a bonus action, letting you cast a spell and swing with your sword in the same turn. Next, take Seeking Spell, allowing you to spend 2 sorcery points and re-roll a failed spell with an attack roll, making your Shakaho and Shows suddenly much scarier. You also gain your first second level spell. Take Hold Person, this is your Rikujokoro spell. Use it on enemies or allies to stop them from doing something stupid, like challenging you in the first place, or trying to cut off their own heads while mind-controlled. Fourth level sorcerers gain a feat or ability score. Take a plus two to your charisma, for a total of 18 now to improve your attacks and spells that much further. You also gain an additional cantrip and spell. Take Word of Radiance and release your spiritual pressure outward so that anything within five feet of you suddenly suffers an explosion of raw pressure driving them back and crushing them. For your spell, take Misty Step, emphasizing your skills at Flash Step even further by allowing you to teleport anywhere within 30 feet that you can see. Fifth level sorcerers gain their first third level spell. Take Counter Spell for the moments when you just need to say Danku against an incoming spell from your opponent. Sixth level divine soul sorcerers gain the Empower Healing feat, allowing them to spend sorcery points to reroll any healing spells that you or anyone within five feet of you use. You also gain an additional 3rd level spell. Take Fireball, and now you have your Sokatsui, for a nice big swirling nuke of blue fire. 7th level sorcerers gain another spell. It could be 4th, but honestly we're not done with 3rd yet. You like your mid-range spells. Take Lightning Bolt, representing your overpowered Byakurai. 8th level sorcerers gain another ability score improvement. Take another plus 2 to Charisma. This will bump you up to the cap of 20 in the ability, maxing you out for your skill with blade and spells at the same time. You also gain an additional spell. Take haste and finally reach the pinnacle of your mastery using flash step. Ninth level sorcerers gain their first fifth level spell. Take animate object. Talk with your DM about roleplaying it as a giant swarm of blades or as a huge construct with roleplay flair or use this to control other blades and send them into your opponent from various angles. Tenth level sorcerers gain heightened spell, allowing you to burn three sorcery points to force disadvantage on the saving throws that a target must make against your spell. You also gain an additional cantrip and spell. Take Shocking Grasp, representing your mastery over Briacurai to the point of using it casually at point-blank range. For your spell, take Dimension Door for the moments when you need to form a Senkai Mon across town. 
though you can't make one to the other planes to report back to your god just yet. 11th level sorcerers gain their 6th level spell, take Mental Prison. This is one option for your Bankai in its various forms. Use it to create a grand black prison covered in glowing blades. And as you do battle quote-unquote with them within their mind, the blades of your spirit and pale and shred them, dealing tremendous psychic damage. Alternatively, if you don't like the whole illusion vibe, take Blade Barrier and form it into a ring around you and your opponent. Twelfth level sorcerers gain an additional feat. Take Tough. You're incredibly sturdy despite your lith frame, and since you'll be engaging in direct melee with people, the majority of your hit dies mean D6s, you're going to need the extra support. Finally, 13th level sorcerers gain a 7th level spell. Take Plane Shift. This is your ability to shift between the planes using your Zanpakuto to form portals to other dimensions. Switching back over to Warlock real quick, 4th level Warlocks gain a feat. Take Resilient and Wisdom. This will even out your uneven score and give you a willpower suitable to resisting the urge to save your about-to-be-executed daughter figure. Mobile would also be a decent secondary option. You also gain another cantrip and a second level spell. Take Minor Illusion to cause intimidation effects based around your thaumaturgy. Make yourself glow with power. Cause dancing pink petals of light to swirl around you. This spell can do all kinds of things. Don't just limit yourself to what Byakuya does, please. It is amazing. Next, take Invisibility as your spell. Combine it with your high-speed movement to seem as though you simply disappeared, or use Bakudo to literally disappear when you need. Fifth-level Warlocks gain an Eldritch Invocation. Take Thirsting Blade, allowing you to attack twice with your blade instead of just once. You also gain your third-level spell, and all your Warlock spell slots are automatically cast at third level. Take Thunderstep for the moments you need to flash step with less grace and more resounding force of get out of my way. Now, we're shifting away from the spellcasting and focusing back on your fairly high melee combative abilities. So, of course, we're going with Fighter. Slight misconception I'll address here. For Fighter, you don't actually need to have 13 Strength. It can be 13 Dexterity or Strength to multiclass into it. Just a heads up, because I know somebody might say something. And because for a long period of time, I thought they needed both. So, you know, the more you know, I guess. Level 1 fighters gain a d10 hit die and a fighting style. Take dueling, making your single weapon that much more deadly in battle for an extra plus 2 to its damage. You also gain second wind, allowing you to recover health based on your fighter level, which won't be great, but it helps. This is also healing that can be performed on a bonus action, which, if you stack it with your cure wounds, could let you get up after taking some hefty hits. Now, as our capstone, level 2 fighters gain action surge, allowing you to take one additional action on your turn once per long or short rest. Not the most glamorous of capstones, but certainly effective. Too bad we're one level short for samurai, but you can't have it all. So how good is this build? Honestly, you're pretty terrifying. You have some ridiculous potential DPS, and the combinations that you're able to use with your mix of sorcery points for Quicken Spell, Hexblade's Curse, and Action Surge, you can dish out some nasty combinations. For example, the ability to take two attacks and then fire Eldritch Blast four times for a piddly cost of two sorcery points. If you take a turn beforehand to use your bonus action and then mark them first with your Hexblade's Curse, that can rack up to some devastating damage. With that combination, that's six attacks with the first two, assuming your packed weapon is just a normal longsword. Each of them will deal 14 to 21 damage, and each Eldritch Blast will deal 12 to 21 damage, all of them having a crit range of 19 to 20. Slap on advantage in the plethora of ways that you can give it to yourself through flanking and distance and surprise and everything else that's in 5e, and that's <laughs> a total of 12 times you can possibly crit. This is why Hexblade Warlocks are scary, folks. Now, speaking of that combination barely taking anything out of you, you have 13 points to use each long rest, and that's about your only resource you'll be wanting for long rests. Your normal spell slots can be replenished with the sorcery points. You have two pack slots that can come back every short rest, along with your fighter abilities and Hexblade's Curse that also return on a short rest. You have the strengths of a normal caster, 
with long-term ability to dip into normal spell slots if there's no room for a short rest, and your cantrips are incredibly strong because Warlock. When your party does get in a short rest, you get things back in spades with Action Surge, Curse, Second Wind, and your pack slots all returning to you. Mix that in with your healing options and surprisingly decent hit points for a caster class main, and you're pretty good at staying up for long and short term. Finally, you are disgustingly mobile, with nearly half your total spell options being based on movement speed or teleportation, the entire map is your oyster. There's also a marvelous combination of using Thunderstep with Quicken Spell and melee attacks to clear a big area, knock out the mobs, and take out the villain that's trying to run away. Now, for weaknesses. I said your hit points were decent, but that's really all they are. Assuming fixed hit points, you're resting at just over 170 hit point total. If you were a pure caster, that'd be amazing, but you like jumping in the middle of melee and using your spells for support and damage, so it really isn't as much as it feels like it is. Next is your saving throws. Thanks to the last feat of resilience, your wisdom saving throw is much better than it was before. But your others, including the ever-popular dexterity saving throw, is really, really bad. That means that one of the most common saves in the game is your weak point. Similarly, Wisdom, the other most common save in the game, is a serious problem until you take that feat. You could take Resilient earlier, but you're pushing your Charisma or hit points back for that. So it's kind of your call on which you'd rather have first. And finally, you're fumbling a lot. As seems to be common with these shonen builds, your skills are honestly pretty subpar across the board. Luckily, you do have some pretty potent physical skills, and Arcana is half decent. Your intimidation capabilities through your ice cold glare is wonderful, but aside that, well, you're not going to be helping too much in roleplay situations. That is, aside from a few niche options. Worse, you lack utility spells to really help cover those issues. Guidance and Minor Illusions with Thaumaturgy is going to be your best friend to help those chances. But that's not what you're here for. You were trained from childhood to hunt and kill monsters and the undead. And that's what you're going to do. Fill in the gaps with your mobility, avoid counterattacks with clever usage of your magic combinations, dish out the damage, and outplay your opponents with strategic use of your numerous options for mobility. Your raw power and destructive capability shines for a reason. Use it, end the undead, and maintain the balance of the world. But maybe let the cold mask and outlook of justice overall drop every now and then. Sometimes it can blind you. And your own blind loyalty can lead to a betrayal of your own beliefs. As always, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please drop it a like, subscribe for more, hit the little bell, all those things YouTubers ask you to do endlessly. I do videos on Dungeons & Dragons as well as my own world once to twice a week. I'd like to thank my Platinum Patrons, Krom and SPS. Your donations mean the world to me. If you'd like to join them, there's a link in the description below to my Patreon. I have various variant rules, homebrew supplement systems, items, spells, and so forth there, as well as some free stuff on World Anvil. Let me know what character build or video you'd like to see next in the comments below. I read them all and reply to as many as I can. As always, I love your input on the things I make. Have an amazing day, everyone. Be safe. Love each other. Goodbye.